Okay, I think we're going to get things started now. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Abby Newman, and I am the Associate Director of the University of Chicago Center for East Asian Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. You may notice some other smiling faces today on your screen. I am joined by Jaya Mukherjee from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, and our guest speaker of honor, Nick Schifrin from PBS NewsHour. Hello. Yes. So Hi, everyone. first, I want to. Great. Thank you. First, let's just take a quick look at today's agenda. After some brief introductions about the sponsors of today's activities, my colleague Joya will introduce our speaker and we will enjoy his wonderful presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A session. And then we will take some time to gather in breakout sessions to reflect and share ideas. Participants will have a chance to connect with one another, to network and to identify opportunities for aligning Mr. Schifrin's reporting with their curricular goals. And finally, we will ask that you take a very, very brief survey at the end of the event to help with our evaluation of programming. Now tonight's event, COVID Crossroads, the pandemic's impact on mainland China, Hong Kong and beyond, is the third part of a multi-day virtual conference co-sponsored with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. These events were designed for educators and the general public to bring award-winning journalists together to discuss the global and local inequities that COVID-19 has amplified. Featuring a combination of journalist-led presentations and interactive activities, the multi-day program has introduced methods for integrating global news and journalism skills into diverse curricula to reinforce students' critical thinking, creativity, and communication skills. Now, a special note for Illinois-based educators. You are eligible to receive CPDU credits for attendance today, and we will provide instructions in the chat box at the end of the event. Now, a few words about the sponsors. The Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Chicago is an interdisciplinary nexus, clearinghouse, and resource for academic exploration and support related to the study of China, Japan, and Korea. We have an extensive film library, and we sponsor a variety of activities, including public lectures, workshops, conferences, film series, cultural events, and K-16 outreach initiatives, including events such as this one. In collaboration with other international and area study centers at the University of Chicago, we are pleased to support professional development opportunities for educators to examine ways to bring international content into classrooms. In these uncertain times, it is more important than ever to foster understanding of diverse perspectives, both domestically and from across the globe. As mentioned before, this lecture is actually the third in a four-part series of events with the Pulitzer Center and the U Chicago Center for Middle Eastern Studies and the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies. These activities are also supported by Title VI National Resource Center grants from the US Department of Education. We will have information at the end of the program today about the last event in this series. This four part series has been and will be recorded and will then be available for viewing and sharing with colleagues at the UChicago Educator Outreach website, educatoroutreach.uchicago.edu. Now, I ask that you take a look at that chat box because we, my colleague is going to cut and paste information about your UChicago sponsors. So please visit our websites, sign up for our mailing lists and follow us on social media. Now, if you ever have any questions about our world regions, do not hesitate to reach out. We are thrilled to present this program in collaboration with the education team of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. I would like to introduce you again to my colleague, Joya, who is K-12 Education Coordinator at the Pulitzer Center. Joya will say a few words about the Pulitzer Center and then introduce our speaker, Nick Schifrin. Joya. Thanks so much. I am going to share my screen um, with all of you. So let's just take a moment for this transition. Thanks so much.
So hi, everyone. It's so nice to be with all of you today. I'm excited to talk about the Poultry Center, which is a journalism organization dedicated to spreading awareness about underreported global issues by finding journalism, by funding journalism that captures underreported news stories. An underreported news story refers to a story that isn't getting the attention that it deserves. We use our platform to amplify these stories by first partnering with journalists like Mr. Schifrin, who are passionately investigating these stories, and then working with educators and students to ensure that the urgent issues covered in these stories are being discussed in classrooms. We also produce many live events for the public, and we support journalists who publish these stories in a range of publications and outlets, like this infographic shows right here. Here are just some of the issues that we in investigate with Pulitzer Center grants. You may notice an issue that resonates with you or an issue that resonates with your students. We'd be really curious to know what those issues are so you can go ahead and share them in the chat box. The education department at the Pulitzer Center has a unique mission to cultivate a more curious, informed, empathetic, and engaged public by connecting students and teachers with underreported global news stories and the journalists who cover them. We know that our mission um, cannot function without your support. Um, and so we offer a range of free programs and resources for educators and students. Anyone has access to our collection of reporting from Pulitzer Center grantees featuring stories published by media outlets from around the world, as well as reporting original to the Pulitzer Center website. We also have hundreds of lesson plans archived in our lesson plan library. These lesson plans are crafted by Pulitzer Center staff or partner educators, um, and they are all standards aligned and encourage students to analyze reporting or make personal connections or take action in their own communities. We offer students and teachers um, the opportunity to host a journalist grantee in their classroom for free throughout the year. Journalists have discussed a range of topics from their career, the reporting process, or nuances of a story they are covering. And finally, we offer workshops for students and teachers year round. All that information can be found on our website or in our weekly news center. Today, we are excited to introduce Mr. Schifrin to all of you. Um, I'm gonna read the first paragraph of this, um, this bio, but um, certainly we'll share a link or two um, of his work on the Pulitzer Center website and his um, social media handles so you can follow him. Um, Nick Schifrin is PBS NewsHour's foreign affairs um, and defense correspondent. He has created week-long in-depth series for NewsHour from Russia, Ukraine, Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya, Cuba, Mexico, and the Baltics. The, in, the series Inside Putin's Russia won a 2018 Peabody Award. So before I pass it off to Mr. Schifrin, um, I'd like to set some norms for the conversation. Um, now, all of you are welcome to share your questions throughout our experience. You can do so in the chat as they arise, and we're gonna be monitoring those questions and putting them in a queue for Mr. Schifrin during the Q&A portion of the event. Um, we also are going to encourage you guys at that time to um, raise your hands virtually and unmute yourself and we'd love to hear your voices. So if you prefer to ask your question that way during that portion, you can do that. Throughout the presentation, since this is a meeting platform, we're encouraging you to keep your mic on mute um, so we can ensure that everyone is enjoying this presentation. Any other lingering questions can be asked in the chat and we are all monitoring those. So please join me in the chat in welcoming Mr. Schifrin. Thank you so much uh, and, and welcome to my office. I will preface this by saying that is not my desk. Uh, my desk is right underneath and slightly slightly cleaner than my colleague John Yang's uh, who's behind me. But it is a, a real pleasure to, to join you uh, in this format. We, we've done this once before uh, and, and I found it entertaining and interesting and, and I hope that, that you find uh, today's conversation uh, the same and I'll certainly learn from you. So please do not be afraid to ask me questions uh, afterward, um, uh, but also you know, during, during the, the presentation and, and for the next 45 minutes or so while I talk, um, you know, it'll be good to see you guys. And, and while everyone will help me, I can also probably see uh, anything that's in, that's in the chat box as well. So please do feel free to 
virtually interrupt, uh, as it were. Um, so I, I want to frame uh, this conversation that we're going to have today, which is uh, going to be uh, about uh, Hong Kong uh, and, and COVID, uh, be about Beijing, about the CCP, uh, China, uh, and, and, and COVID. And uh, finally, we'll do Xinjiang. We'll do the Uyghurs and, and what's happened there uh, and, and as it relates to COVID and, and try and tease out some, some larger points. Um, I want to frame it with, with a couple of, of big thoughts. Um, which is always helpful for me and, and hopefully helpful for you. Uh, so, so number one, uh, as, as those of you who are studying today's China know, uh, the, perhaps the principal um, takeaway uh, of, of Xi Jinping's uh, era, uh, perhaps the principal difference between him and all of his predecessors is uh, what I would call an apparent apathy to outside influence. Um, we all know the history uh, of, of modern China post Mao um, and, and the various rulers, whether it's hide and bide or not. But, but throughout, there's been a consistency uh, of being less interested in causing people's ire, causing the international community's ire. And there's been concern about international um, judgment and, and, and international um, persecution is probably a, a too big of a word, international punishment for any, any policies. And, and so what I think we see throughout the last nine years since Xi Jinping became president, what, what I would call uh, an, an apathy toward that external pressure. Uh, and that's obviously played out in Hong Kong over the last year, and, and we'll talk about that, uh, and how that relates to COVID. Uh, the, the second big takeaway, uh, I think, at least that frames how I think of Xi Jinping's China, um, is uh, the ability to act um, that wasn't that didn't exist before, and the willingness to do so. Uh, and so, if we think about that in, in a military context, we think about uh, what is arguably not perhaps not arguably the the fastest military modernization in world history, other than perhaps uh, Weimar Germany. Um, and and we see not only the capacity increase, but the willingness to use the military increase. And so we will see that play out um, as, as, as I think we talk about uh, COVID uh, again in Hong Kong, but also vaccine diplomacy and mass diplomacy. Uh, and, and again, uh, when it comes to Uyghurs. Uh, and then the third part, I, I would argue, uh, so if those two are, are externally focused, internally focused, it's almost a cliche uh, that we say that the Communist Party is, is most motivated by survival, uh, but it's true. Uh, and, um, yeah, and, and when it comes to dissent, and then when it comes to uh, criticism, um, there is no brooking any of it. Uh, and, and in my opinion, that extends to the other, that, that extends to uh, a version of uh, being a Han Chinese in, in 2021 or 2015 or in, into the future uh, that, that, that the CCP uh, believes in. Uh, and, and that's where Uyghurs comes in. And, and that's perhaps one of the reasons why Uyghurs have no place, at least as uh, a cultural other, as a linguistic other, uh, why they uh, seem to have no place according to Beijing in, in modern Chinese society. Uh, and you may dispute that and say it's all about Belt and Road and connecting to Europe. But anyway, so, and, and so we'll see that play out as well. Uh, through COVID, um, uh, through COVID. So, all right. So those are kind of my my three big big takeaways, uh, and you can feel free to dispute uh, any or all of those. Um, but uh, I can share my screen now, uh, and let me just make sure that I share the correct one. Okay. So you should be able to see uh, a, a rather basic uh, Hong Kong slide here with the photo of, of Hong Kong residents waiting. Yeah, you got a thumbs up. Okay. All right. So let's talk about Hong Kong and, and COVID and how that that plays into uh, some of the, the overall themes that we talked about when it comes to Beijing. Mm. Tomorrow, sorry, Wednesday, I guess tomorrow is it's already tomorrow in Hong Kong. Uh, it is uh, one year since the national security law was passed. Exactly. Uh, and you know this audience knows knows very well uh, what that is, um, but I bring that up uh, specifically to contrast it to 
the early success that Hong Kong had in COVID. So, you know, we in the West, we in the media, um, uh, you know, a lot of people studying what was what's happening uh, in Hong Kong and, and, and in mainland China. Uh, uh, we're so focused on politics in Hong Kong, uh, even though it was the middle of, of COVID. Uh, and, and what was interesting about, to me, about the initial COVID response from Hong Kong residents uh, was that while they were fighting the government, or at least most of them, the majority of them, um, they were fighting COVID together. And there was a real sense, we did a story uh, about a year ago, uh, or maybe 11 months ago, about a month after the national security law, with, with a few Hong Kong residents. And, and they described how despite the politics, despite their resistance to um, uh, the crackdown, uh, the, the arrests, uh, the expanding of this version of patriotism that, that Beijing defined for the first time in modern Hong Kong history. Um, despite that, they were interested in banding together uh, and working together with, um, with each other uh, to, to fight COVID. And, and the government, or at least the health authorities were, were helping them do that. Uh, so let's, let's talk about what Hong Kong did right. Uh, so as, as I'm sure you know, and, and followed in Taiwan and to a certain extent, uh, Japan, uh, a couple other cases in, in Southeast Asia and East Asia, there was an awareness of COVID very early on. And so what we saw was um, Hong Kong scientists and, and residents, uh, you know, reading the news uh, out of Beijing saying there's nothing to see here in early January, 2020. Uh, and they said, uh oh, that's, that's bad actually. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, Taiwan authorities had people in Wuhan. I'm, I'm not sure if Hong Kong authorities did, but certainly they were getting reports directly from Wuhan and, and they knew it was serious. Uh, and the reason they took it so seriously, as, as I'm sure all of you will remember, is SARS. You know, th this is um, uh, a city that um, really was, was decimated by, by SARS. At least we think of it as decimated in, in the past, the context for a health emergency, of course, has changed over the last 18 months. Uh, but, but Hong Kong residents, uh, their memory of SARS uh, is, is seared on, on their brains. The, the images of, uh, of, of bodies being taken out of, of high rises uh, in Hong Kong during the SARS crisis, um, the number of people who got sick, the speed with which they got sick, um, uh, really made people acutely aware of what was possible when it came to a pathogen coming out of, of mainland China. Uh, and so cognizant of, of that, uh, there was a few things that health authorities did. So they learned from SARS that they had a bunch of red tape uh, and immediately they, they dropped all the red tape. Uh, so that just allowed them to make decisions quicker. Um, they had uh, masks. Uh, they increased the number of masks and when there was a run on masks, the government offered masks for free. Uh, and then very quickly at the airport, there was uh, a setup so that when you flew in, you, you'd get a test, whatever early test existed uh, by the spring. Uh, there was a room with social distancing. You could take pictures. You know, the Hong Kong authorities wanted the world to know that it was safe to fly into Hong Kong. Uh, and if you got tested, I mean, you were tested, uh, and, if, and if it was a positive uh, result, you immediately were sent to, hosp to the hospital, no, no, no passing go, no collecting $200. Uh, and if you passed, uh, meaning if you weren't COVID positive, you went straight home. Uh, and the quarantines were imposed, uh, were enforced rather, um, uh, with, a, with a bracelet, uh, with text messages, with cell phone tracking. I'm, I'm sure many of you guys know this history. Uh, um, and, and also there was a civil society aspect to this, which, which I believe was uh, almost a product of the organization around the politics um, starting, um, you know, starting years before, a year before the national security law or a year and a half before the national security law. Uh, and, and that civil society pushed the Hong Kong authorities to take this more seriously. So at one point, Beijing urged Hong Kong um, not to close the border and then, um, 
there was a strike uh, by doctors, there was a strike by civil society, uh, and they pushed the, the government to take this uh, more seriously. And remember, even as we're seeing kind of the biggest political crisis in Hong Kong uh, in, in years, uh, and health authorities uh, were absolutely um, uh, critical, uh, taking it seriously, creating treatments, making sure all of the research would, would be free of red tape, uh, more fast, uh, scientific advice to, to residents and all that. And so I, I, I kind of paint this picture because it's, it's still so interesting to me that that, that happened and that, that dialogue, if you will, uh, between civil society and between the people and the government um, happened. And, and really it was uh, very much a product of, of the lessons of SARS. And so here we are, fast forward, um, and nobody wants the vaccine. I think the latest number that I saw was 25 or 30 uh, percent, and, and it may not even be that high. I think that's an estimate. So 20 percent, uh, 25 percent. Um, we all know that you know that this is uh, you know among the most modern cities in in the world, the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. There's no uh, reason for vaccine hesitancy on on paper. Uh, there, there have been, as I'm sure you guys have seen, news stories in Hong Kong uh, about some adverse effects of vaccines. So I don't want to make this all about politics and all about um, uh, uh, trust in government, which is what we're about to talk about. Uh, and so there have been some polls done in which the people who don't want vaccines say that, oh, I read that, you know, if you're older, you're going to get sick. I read an, uh, an old man died of his vaccine. By the way, none of that seems to be true. At, at least the scientists say none, none of that is true. But you know, when when these stories take hold, uh, they, they do have an impact. Uh, but the main the main reason uh, that that people are not getting the vaccine is is a mistrust of of government. Uh, here we are uh, talking about one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world, uh, the financial hub of of Asia for so many years. Um, a, a, a place that was the, uh, in many ways, the financial um, go around, the financial outlet for, for the mainland for many years. Uh, Beijing saw Hong Kong as a, as a necessary requirement for foreign currency to coming into the country. Uh, it saw it as an international hub in which international businesses uh, and business people could feel safe investing and, and could bring money in uh, that would be, you know, uh, um, that would be, be funneled up to Beijing in, in part. Uh, and a city that, you know, they tolerated the British era freedoms. Um, and all that's gone. You know, any, any of you who've read Apple Daily, any of you who, uh, hell, have, have read the New York Times at all from Hong Kong in the last year, uh, know, know full well uh, how far Hong Kong has, has fallen um, and how much Carrie Lam's administration is seen as, um, um, you know, in bed with, I didn't want to use that phrase, but, but you know, seen as, as largely um, silenced and controlled and manipulated and taken over, whatever verb you want to use, uh, by, by Beijing. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's a story that's been told many times. Uh, but, but it does go to, I think, you know, today's China and, and COVID. So if you ask Joshua Wong, if you ask Nathan Law, if you ask Lee Chuck Yan, if you ask Martin Lee, if you ask any of these um, uh, fighters for democracy, whether the new generation or, or Martin is, is in his 80s, uh, as I'm sure you guys know, uh, the, the old school fighters, um, you know, they, they, will, um, they, they will say that, that basically Hong Kong is lost. You know, there's, there's simply, it's just simply not a, a safe city for uh, anybody who believes in the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression uh, to live in. Uh, and what they will also say uh, is that Beijing used COVID as a cover. Now, you know, I understand this argument. I'm not completely uh, 
convinced of it because I think Hong Kong has gotten so much international attention that everybody knows about what's going on in Hong Kong. But nonetheless, this is the, the, the activist argument is that uh, Beijing accelerated its plans for Hong Kong because of COVID. Um, and, and just to add to their argument before we talk about alternatives, you know, they, they see the world consumed with itself, whether, you know, in, in the United States and the Trump administration, everything that was happening, um, or, or Europe, um, uh, and, and the divides between the US and Europe and, and the Western voice being, being weakened there. Um, and the argument goes that Beijing thought this would be a good time to execute what they always had planned, which was the stifling of the freedom of law and, and the rule of law in Hong Kong uh, and, and the core freedom of speech. You know, I think the alternative uh, argument that, that some scholars make uh, uh, is, is a little bit less about COVID um, and more about Xi Jinping uh, and his own plans. Uh, she has, has personal connections with Hong Kong. His father uh, dealt with Hong Kong quite a bit. Uh, it's been written that he uh, you know, uh, always had a personal motivation and a personal interest in turning Hong Kong into just another Chinese city. Uh, regardless of the reason this happened in COVID. Uh, and, and I think the, the impact uh, of that is, is furthering the points that we talked about at, at the beginning. One, um, you had the combination of international sanctions, international um, horror, uh, international statements again and again and again against what was happening in Hong Kong. And uh, it, it, it changed no behavior. In fact, the behavior accelerated uh, and, and continues to this day. As we saw, we've, we've now seen seven Apple Daily journalists arrested under the national security law as of yesterday. Um, so a clear, uh, again, like I call it, uh, you can dispute it, an apathy to international opinion. Um, uh, the second thing is, is you know, the third point that I made, uh, the, the no brooking of dissent. You know, I think Beijing looked out at the, what was peaceful rallies in, in early 2019 um, and the sheer numbers. I mean, I, I was there uh, the night they, they uh, they broke into LegCo they, the night that they broke into the Legislative Council. And I think that was 1.4 million. Um, I mean, these are, uh, you know, huge, huge, huge numbers uh, of people. Um, uh, and so they saw those huge numbers of people. And then, of course, they saw it get violent. Uh, and, and to them, you know, that meant uh, two things combined. You know, one is, this dissent has gone too far, this criticism has gone too far. Uh, and in their mind, it threatens stability. And, and you know, if, if we take the CCP at its word, uh, you know, stability is something that they value perhaps more than anything. Uh, and so because this dissent did, did both of those things, um, there, was, uh, there was a willingness and eagerness, whatever it was, who knows, uh, to, to crack down in Hong Kong. And so here we are, we, we have a city that uh, is slowly um, going to lose some of its um, brain trust, certainly gonna lose a lot of young liberals and, and progressives and, and people who believe in democracy. Uh, it may or may not lose businesses. I think international businesses are, um, uh, are, are treading a thin line. They know full well what happens to them if they if they criticize uh, Beijing, as, as we've seen Xinjiang and some of the social media boycotts. Um, and so we may 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 keep businesses there. But you know the story of of Hong Kong from 2019 to 20, 2021 and the story of COVID in in Hong Kong ends up as uh, the narrative of a city that was willing to band together to fight um, a disease despite the terrible political battles that were happening um, becomes a city in the end where, where nobody, well, well, where most people are not willing to get the vaccine. Uh, and, and that is a remarkable, remarkable change, remarkable shift in people's attitudes um, 
uh, towards um, uh, toward towards their government. Um, and and sadly, you know, we're we're talking this week because we're doing a story on this this week to to people who who are leaving, who who want to leave, who who are pulling the trigger on DNO passport and trying to go to the UK, who are getting to Taiwan. Um, talked to the Taiwanese the other day and, and authorities have, have basically cut off the Taiwanese office in Hong Kong. So it's very, very difficult now to apply and get visas to Taiwan. Uh, and, and so, you know, that is the narrative of COVID um, in Hong Kong, that a, a, a Chinese, um, a, a Beijing government that does not care about international um, uh, judgment uh, and uh, that Brooks No Dissent uh, essentially removed Hong Kong's freedoms um, during the biggest pandemic in a century. Um, and there's not much that anybody has been able to do about it or, or can probably do about it in the future. Um, <clears throat> so there you go, that's my, that's my Hong Kong spiel. All right, but that, that obviously connects to and comes with, within a larger context of, of China and um, uh, of China and, and, and COVID and what we now call vaccine diplomacy. Um, so uh, I think the last talk I gave uh, on this, uh, we talked about the early days of COVID and, and what Beijing did and didn't do. Um, and frankly, what Wuhan authorities did and didn't do. Uh, and I think, I feel like that's, that's um, well-tread territory, but it's important uh, to, to remind of those early days of cover-up uh, by Wuhan authorities and maybe by Beijing authorities, but regardless, at least three weeks, perhaps as long as five weeks, uh, in which a lot of people in Wuhan knew that a new coronavirus was spreading human to human uh, and Beijing didn't acknowledge it until January 20th. Um, say nothing about what the US did for the next six months, but anyway, that's not what the the, the, that's not what this talk is about. Um, and so for those few weeks, uh, you know, there, there was what, what um, you know, most, uh, certainly the American government today and under the Trump administration and most independent experts call it cover up, whether it was local or Beijing is a matter of debate. And so uh, fast forward, um, uh, you know, we all remember the story of Li Wen Liang uh, and, and these, these, these scientists uh, who did blow the whistle. Um, and, and Dr. Lee, of course, um, tragically died. When he died, and this is less discussed, um, there was obviously an outpouring of, of sympathy. Uh, and, and there's photos today in, in Taiwan and Hong Kong of Dr. Lee Wen Liang, what he represents. But it actually spread. There, there, are, there are Twitter videos that still exist. There's social media videos that, that still exist. Um, you know, quickly deleted on Weibo, but, but they were out there. Uh, of um, government authorities visiting Wuhan um, and people shouting out of their windows, everything's fake. You know, what you're saying is fake. I mean, it was, it was really remarkable. Um, and so, you know, I go back to the stability point. So it was at pretty much that day or the day after that, um, uh, that, that, that Beijing kind of coalesces around a few a few things. Um, one was mass diplomacy. So I, I put that frame on the next few points that I'm gonna make because partially this is a response to internal criticism and a deflection. But very typical, I mean, you don't need an authoritarian government to, to need a deflection from internal criticism, but very typical of an authoritarian government. Whenever criticism uh, is, is mounting, you know, um, you point to the outside. Uh, and so there was a few ways they, they did that. One was mass diplomacy. And mass diplomacy wasn't really just mass diplomacy, selling masks. It was, ha ha, look at everyone else who doesn't have masks. Uh, look at all of these countries who are failing to stop the spread. And we have to give China credit. For whatever reason, you can call the tactics um, uh, aggressive, um, but um, it worked. Right, very little spread of COVID compared to the rest of the world back then, uh, and so they coalesce around a couple of things. One is mass diplomacy, uh, so it is what uh, Xi Jinping called the People's War, um, um, fighting it inside of China and then exporting the 
uh, success of China, and I use that word specifically, uh, uh, overseas. Uh, and so that is PPE. They have, um, you know, I forget the numbers, what, what percentage of PPE, but it's, you know, we, we all remember these stories. It's astronomically high, 80 or 90% of, of so much of the PPE comes from China. And so the mass diplomacy started. Um, and from the beginning, it was ideological. It is our success is the success of our system. And aren't we nice? Here are your, uh, here are your masks. Um, so that was, that was the first thing. And, and the second thing, of course, was the external, uh, the external um, accusations. Um, we'll get to Wolf Warrior diplomats in a second. I want to talk about that when it comes to Xinjiang. But um, the original Wolf, well, actually not the original Wolf Warrior in Southeast, that's probably Young Jae Chur in the US 15 years ago. But the first Wolf Warrior diplomat that we referred to as the Wolf Warrior diplomat because of his, shall we say, Twitter skills. Uh, Zhao Lijian, the, the deputy spokesperson in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, today, uh, goes out, we all remember this last March, and says, you know, might have been Fort Detrick. I think you guys should look into that when it comes to SARS. And so we had mass diplomacy and we had the external. Uh, and that set the tone. You know, that, that really is what we see throughout this process when it comes to, to China and, and COVID. Um, this initial criticism, you know, well, the initial cover up, followed by the police state uh, enacting what it does best and succeeding at, at keeping COVID down. Uh, and uh, Xi Jinping and the CCP looking around and say the world is vulnerable uh, and, and the United States especially is flailing. Uh, and so we should go out and expand our influence and we should go out and convince people that our model is, is the right one. Uh, and so the first way to do that was masks. Uh, and so, um, you know, we did stories uh, uh, from Italy. I remember this one, uh, which of course was one of the first places in the West that was so badly hit. And, you know, there are Italian governors walking to cameras and hugging uh, a pallets of Chinese masks with Chinese flags on them. And, coming to the cameras and, and saying, thank you, China, thank you, you saved our lives. I mean, this was, this is uh, uh, catnip <laughs> uh, to Beijing. Um, there were at one point, I think we, cause we tallied this, we have access to all this video. There were press conferences in a three or four day span uh, held um, among other countries in Nigeria, Kenya, Venezuela, uh, I forget which other South American countries, um, uh, Philippines, Cambodia, um, Italy, I mentioned, I think Greece uh, got an initial, initial batch of, of Chinese PPE. And it was very curious that suddenly these press conferences were held uh, within a few days of each other. Um, and so mass diplomacy became the ideological argument for COVID. Um, the ideological argument that the Communist Party is a better system than Western democracy, which is flailing. And anyone who watched CCTV, uh, sorry, CGTN, uh, whether in English or in Mandarin, got a steady stream of, of what one of the anchors, I remember quoting in the documentary we did, uh, said, um, he highlighted Governor Cuomo criticizing the federal government in New York. Cuomo said something like, what are, you know, what are you doing sending me four ventilators or 40 ventilators? I need 4,000. You pick the 3,960 people who are going to die. Very powerful line, which was taken by CGTN, played, and the anchor says, wow, what a system, what, what a difference two systems can make. We helped the people of Wuhan. Washington abandoned New York, period, uh, argument over. Um, and so here we are, vaccine diplomacy. Um, much of the same thing. Uh, so I've got this map on, on here, uh, which is uh, from, from McGill uh, and UNICEF and, and other places. Um, you know, it looks like actually, I wish that I could, I don't think I can see your chat while I'm sharing. Um, oh, well, I would, I would be answering your questions if I was able to do that. Well, maybe I'll take off the presentation for a second. Um, so uh, I, I believe the, the, the latest number that I saw is 70 countries, um, and it may be more like 90, um, depends on how you count, 
ha have either approved uh, a Chinese vaccine um, or struck a deal, uh, a bilateral deal to get Chinese vaccines. Uh, and Xi Jinping, uh, as always, uh, has uh, his, his phrase, which is, you know, the global good. We are doing the global good or global public good, I think is how you translate it. Um, and so, you know, the argument continues. Um, obviously, you know, this is a few months ago before the U.S. was was in the case in the place that it is. But, you know, vaccine diplomacy started as soon as the Chinese ramped up its vaccines. Um, and, you know, uh, with a special attention to countries like those in, in Latin America uh, that are vulnerable uh, economically and that have ties to Taiwan, uh, a special focus to anyone in Europe that, that they could get to, and of course, special focus in, in Asia and Southeast Asia uh, with any countries connected to Belt and Road. Um, and so uh, that, is, that is, you know, what we saw. And, and again, going back to those original points that I made, um, this is this one's less about um, an, an apathy to international criticism and more a capacity and a desire to use that capacity to extend Chinese influence. Uh, and so it, it has become very clear that when the Chinese diplomats talk about the vaccines that they want to give these countries uh, in the deals that China makes with these countries, um, there is uh, a, a, an acknowledgement that this will increase Chinese influence. Um, now, that may be, you know, I, I, I understand that if we had, you know, a spokesperson for the Chinese government, you know, he would say, Schifrin, you're, you're doing it again. You're imposing, you know, your, your Washington perspective um, on, on everything. Um, but you know, I, I think that I'm just going to see if I can see some of the chat here while, while I keep talking. Um, so I, I think that they would argue that we haven't imposed anything. Um, uh, let's see, stop, sure, sorry. That we haven't imposed anything. Um, uh, that they have been doing it for the, uh, for the benefit of, of the world, as Xi Jinping said. Uh, but I, I think most independent analysts will acknowledge that you know, when it comes to Belt and Road, when it comes to economic uh, development in, in many countries, um, uh, th there is a notion uh, that um, uh, there is a notion uh, that um, you know, exporting something that the that a country needs, in this case, vaccine, uh, in the Belt and Road case, trains, uh, roads, uh, infrastructure, technology. You know these countries get a great deal from from China. You know China's um, <clears throat> system and and banks uh, allow you know Huawei and uh, and and the railroad companies to package these deals pennies on the dollar. Uh, and so for many countries it's it's a no-brainer. Um, you know what the Trump administration tried to say, uh, and Pompeo was was blunt about it to say the least. But what we tried to point out is that that those deals come with strings. Uh, and so you see now, uh, and we'll get to the U.S. response right now, what, what you see from the U.S. now is going out of their way to say these vaccines come with no strings. Um, all right, so let me, let me uh, Ron asks, uh, how did China manage to gear up their vaccine production to supply the world while the U.S. has not done the same? So, so this, is, this is interesting. So this is part of uh, the, the Chinese narrative, uh, and we'll get to questions of, of quality when it comes to this. Um, so for a while, China decided that it was as important or more important to export its vaccines, or at least promise to export its vaccines, than it was to deliver to its own people. And that, I would argue, is a quintessentially authoritarian uh, status, because no democracy, none, ever, you know, would ever be allowed to say, we're going to export all these vaccines before we give it to you. And case in point is Europe, right? The European Union, uh, I forget exactly the numbers, but give or take has exported as many vaccines to COVAX, the UN system, as it has administered to its own people. And, um, <laughs> you know, if you ask Emmanuel Macron uh, or, or Chancellor Merkel um, or the Irish prime minister or the Italians, I mean, my God, there is such anger such anger 
uh, among these populations. And, and these governments fear that, um, that they will be judged for some of those decisions. So, you know, obviously China has a lot of capacity when it comes to vaccine manufacturing, but, you know, so does the US and Europe. Uh, but really that, that's a political, um, that's a political decision um, that, that an authoritarian government uh, can make. Um, Ron also asked about the difference on my map. Um, so let's, let's, let's go back to that. Um, anyway, so um, okay, so vaccine approvals, meaning a government has approved uh, a Chinese vaccine. Uh, the, um, uh, the dark blue is vaccine donations. So we see, you know, three or four in, in South and Central America. Uh, we see a handful in, uh, in, in the Middle East, in Southwest Asia, in Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, and then quite a few in, in Africa. And, and other support uh, is, is things, um, you know, beyond PPE, but I, I think it does include PPE. Uh, and so th those are the differences. Uh, but the bottom line is the Chinese have, you know, have clearly dis wanted to um, take something that they had and expand it out and, and spread their influence. Uh, at least, at least that's that's what I would argue. Um, and so they run into a couple of things now. Uh, but here we are, you know, almost 18 months uh, after COVID spread around the world, and and 19 months after Wuhan experienced its first COVID. Uh, we're talking about quality. Uh, questions. Um, story recently pointing out Seychelles, Chile, Bahrain, Mongolia are four of the countries that have inoculated more than 50% with Chinese vaccines, uh, with Sinopharm and Sinovac, uh, but are, are at the same time in the top 10 of outbreaks. Uh, and so, you know, what you'll see, and interestingly, the Biden administration is doing less of this. Uh, but what you'll see is China's critics jumping on this and, and saying, um, you know, kind of an, like a, an almost old Orientalist argument, which is the Chinese vaccines aren't as good. The Chinese aren't as good, even though they got there first. The Chinese aren't as good, even though they're offering it pennies on the dollar. Um, and so we'll see if that argument picks up. The Trump administration absolutely would, would say that out loud all the time when it came to masks. They, they seized on a couple of uh, Italian and Spanish government officials who criticized the Chinese PPE who had arrived, that had arrived as, uh, as ineffective. Uh, and let me tell you, the Trump guys would call journalists all the time saying, see, the Spaniards, you know, said that they got a bunch of bad masks. I'm like, they sent a billion out or two billion or three billion yesterday, you know, uh, but that's what <coughs> the U.S. was pointing out. And so herein comes the difference between the Trump and Biden administration when it comes to, to China. <clears throat> and then we'll go to Uyghurs for, for a few minutes. Um, so the U.S. response. So the Trump administration, as we all know, uh, like to criticize uh, China. And, and so um, that accelerated, I would say, in, in 2020, uh, as the president, as President Trump uh, believed that, um, <clears throat> believed that criticizing China was politically expedient for his reelection campaign, let's be honest. Um, before that, there was a divide. There was President Trump straddling the middle between Jared Kushner and Steve Mnuchin, who argued for, you know, business ties to China being as important, if not more important, than national security concerns. And the entire national security apparatus, uh, whether the National Security Council, uh, the Pentagon, uh, some of the intelligence uh, community, arguing that China was an existential threat, uh, and, and especially Chinese technology. Uh, and so COVID came and the people who <coughs> wanted to criticize China gained leverage inside the administration and it was off to the races by last summer. I think the number of initiatives, executive orders and regulations changed, uh, not laws, regulations and EOs um, <clears throat> were in the dozens in, in the last six months of 2020. Um, and so that was, that was how the Trump administration uh, responded. So the US uh, under Biden administration, uh, we've all heard it, right? <clears throat> uh, foreign policy is for the middle class. <clears throat> and the best way to take on authoritarianism is to fix democracy at home. 
Um, and so you get this um, embrace of an ideological battle that both Trump and Biden have had. Uh, but Biden, the Biden team, they embrace the idea of an ideological battle, but they're fighting it here. They're fighting it with infrastructure bills. They're fighting it by tackling what they call systemic racism, uh, um, what they see as uh, endemic problems within uh, U.S. society. Uh, and they're tackling it through voting rights. You know, they believe that uh, for uh, the U.S. to beat China, beat China is the wrong word, for the U.S. to outcompete China long term, they have to focus on, on the United States. Uh, and so I contrast those two in the context of what we're talking about, <clears throat> because what has been the response to China's acceleration of its desire to expand influence around the world, whether mass diplomacy or, or vaccine diplomacy? The Trump administration would highlight quality questions, uh, would sanction, would punish, uh, what the Biden administration is trying to do uh, is be a better example, be a, to borrow Reagan's quote, a, a better shining city on the hill. I think Pompeo would say, come on, Schiffer, and, you know, we were doing both, but clearly the Biden administration focus is trying to do that. And so the interesting legacy of COVID as the next few years play out when it comes to U.S.-China relations and the future of the mainland uh, is whether we will look back on Pfizer and Moderna and those donations by the US government around the world and say that's what got the world out of COVID. We might, we very well might. We might you know, look at the numbers with, with Cinevac uh, and Cinefarm and say, sorry guys, you just didn't do it quite well enough. Um, will we say that? I, I don't know. Will we say the Chinese sent you know, to more countries faster early on. And, you know, these Latin American countries, you know, eventually flipped and, and no longer recognize Taiwan or these African countries, you know, are closer to, to China now. You know, I don't know. I, I, think, I think the jury's out and I think these things will, will play out over years. Uh, but clearly the, the lesson, you know, of the last year <clears throat> has been that, that China has seen a moment in time in which they could try and expand their influence uh, and have done so through health, through vaccines, through PPE. Uh, and the US has, has given two versions of the response. You know, one is a calling out of problems, trying to rally the world using the bully pulpit of, in this case, the, the, the State Department podium, uh, even more so than, than the White House. Um, and then now this rhetoric about you know, allies working together uh, and being the better example, uh, sending the better vaccine, you know, and, and, and those, are, those are the two examples. So, you know, I think when, when the history is written of, um, <clears throat> you know, how Chinese, uh, how China changed uh, after COVID and how the world changed vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, it, it's not clear to me, you know, who will win out, but uh, at the very least, uh, we will be talking about these efforts to counter China's mass diplomacy and vaccine diplomacy uh, and, and, and what worked. Um, at the very least, I think we can all agree that like in 2007, uh, when Beijing looked at the US financial crisis and, and realized, I mean, historians have written about this very clearly, there was a moment uh, at, at which Beijing, uh, when President Obama said, the United States is no longer the lender of last resort, when Beijing realized, hey, that they're not as strong as, as we thought they were, frankly. Um, and, and it became an opportunity for them. And five years later, we had Xi Jinping. You know, we, we may see that moment now. We may see uh, Beijing realizing that, um, you know, the US is quite divided internally um, uh, and, and the lessons there. Um, so let me just stop before I get to, to Uyghurs quickly uh, and see if, oops, uh, see if, if there's any um, <clears throat> any further questions here. Um, yeah, India. That's a very good point. Um, um, and 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 so so the the point is that uh, you know India exported when numbers were low, but as cases went up, uh, they they stopped the exports, and and Modi did take a big hit. 
uh, especially in West Bengal, that's absolutely right. Uh, and that's critically important for the world. I, I will say that, you know, I think, uh, uh, I forget the percentage, but well over 60 or 70 percent of COVAX was, was going to be with vaccines developed or produced, sorry, not developed, produced in India. Uh, and so the Indian government, uh, I think, has, has, has not even put a date on when they might export, start exporting again, and it, and it could be even 2022. So that will be a difficult, um, that will be uh, yet another quiver in, in the uh, Chinese um Sorry, another uh, arrow in the Chinese quiver, right? Uh, arguing that, look, the UN failed, you know, Western democracies failed, we, we were better uh, at this kind of thing. Uh, all right, so Liza asks, or Liza, sorry, uh, do you think China's being vilified to some degree in terms of its COVID response to other countries? For example, some news stories out of India and Fox News claimed China was selling masks back to Italy, which Italy had originally donated to them in their time of need. Do your knowledge is this accurate or is China being cast in the negative light? Uh, it's a very specific question that I happen to very specifically know the answer to, and the answer is yes. So um, Italy, China, uh, let's see if I can remember this exactly right. Uh, but but so Chinese masks to Italy were not free; they were not a donation. Uh, Italy bought them, um, and uh, they had been transferred, or, the, or or funds had been transferred the other way beforehand. Um, and so what was interesting about that story is that came out and then almost immediately uh, the mask became free. Uh, and so what was a, uh, a deal or what had been deals, I should say, became donations. Um, and, you know, in my opinion, that goes uh, against the argument that they're apathetic to international criticism. Um, you know, they're very aware when, when they're criticized. Uh, and so that's an example actually of, of Chinese changing, um, changing their behavior. Um, um, all right, so uh, I will go quickly to, to Uyghurs. Uh, what time we got? 6, 6.30. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll wrap this up and we'll do a more formal question and answer here. Uh, okay, so Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Now, uh, um, we, we had a discussion internally about whether this was connected to COVID. Um, the answer is yes, uh, to a certain extent. So, so uh, what happened in, in um, the spring of 2020 was that COVID spread in detention camps. Um, and I use that phrase specifically, Uyghurs use concentration camps. Um, I, I don't think that's an accurate phrase. These are detention camps. These are work camps. Uh, these are camps in which Uyghur culture, language, uh, books, uh, everything is, is being deleted, being erased, uh, where, where Uyghurs are forced to, uh, to communicate in Mandarin, forced to uh, accept indoctrination about how important the uh, CCP is and how, how uh, beneficent Xi Jinping is. Uh, and it's part of a larger campaign, which you know I don't have to focus on right now, uh, to eliminate uh, Uyghurs as this other Uyghurs as uh, as a group that speaks a different language, that looks different, that that um, uh, that lives um, you know separated from the rest of the community, and and it's it's clear, uh, and you can also see this in the crackdown on on Christians even. Uh, that that you know what had been brooked in the past in terms of other people looking different, sounding different, practicing different faiths uh, is is just simply much less accepted in in Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping's China. So anyway, so that's that's the very very brief backstory of of Uyghurs right now. So they're in detention camps. Um, you know we don't know exactly how many, but you know we're talking about thousands of people in small, relatively small areas. And so one of the few stories we have that actually got released was somebody that uh, came to the BBC, came to us, came to a few other media outlets, uh, and it was an uncle uh, of uh, a detainee, a Uyghur model, actually, <clears throat> who had been born in Xinjiang but worked in mainland China. So his features were acceptable to, to a Han audience uh, as slightly exotic, but he didn't look... Um, uh, he didn't look like he was obviously from Xinjiang, um, at least to, to the people who, who I talked to. Uh, anyway, so he was, you know, a successful member of Han Chinese society 
who had grown up in, in Xinjiang. Um, he was sent back to Xinjiang and he was picked up and, and put in the camp. Um, and we know what happened because he uh, was moved from one facility to another and they didn't check his pockets and he had his phone. And so I think to this day, this is the only uh, video documentation taken by a detainee. I may be wrong about that, but he, uh, he couldn't speak because there was a guard outside his door, but he held up the, the phone to himself, panned down and showed how he was shackled to the bed uh, and showed his room and, and clipped, the, clipped the camera outside uh, and showed the guards and got it to his uncle, I think his aunt who gave it to the uncle who talked to the media uh, and, um, uh, and, and told the story of how because of COVID, because it was spreading, he didn't know it was COVID, but he just knew that, that a coronavirus, I think he'd overheard, or a virus was spreading throughout the camps that he was moved. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's a rare a moment in time in which we did have a, a window into what was happening to these camps. So these camps we, we, we know had very many COVID cases. Uh, I, I don't believe we know it, it, how many people died, how many people got sick. I, I've never seen those, those numbers. Um, but I just wanna highlight one, one thing on, on this. Um, so you know, we all have followed the, the US and Western response to, to Uyghurs. Um, you know, the, the talking point from like the Holocaust Museum is hopefully I get this language right, that the largest internment uh, based on a religion or ethnicity since World War II. Um, and, and that's what we're talking about the scale, whether it's a million or three million, you know, um, is it's just an extraordinary attempt to target uh, an entire group of people. Um, you know, I would argue because because they're other, but but there are some scholars who argue this is about Belt and Road through, through Xinjiang and stability. Um, anyway, so as, the, um, as this story comes out about COVID in the camps, like I said, the BBC did it first, uh, and I think, um, <clears throat> uh, and I think we did it uh, a few weeks later, and some, some others also talked to, to his uncle. Um, you see this, this wolf warrior diplomacy that I, I referenced before uh, emerging much, much faster. Um, and, and you saw one uh, Chinese diplomat, uh, especially in, in the UK, uh, because the BBC aired this uh, initially, get very aggressive with, with journalists, with people uh, challenging them. Uh, we saw uh, that, of course, from the, the podium of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in Beijing. And, and we've seen it a little bit personally here as well, people criticizing uh, my work and, and some of other my colleagues work who, who to highlight some of this stuff. Um, and so I, I highlight when it comes to, to Xinjiang uh, because I, I think it, it really does go to something that has existed uh, about Beijing for a long time and, and very much exists today. Um, uh, and, and certainly is, is embodied by Yang Jiechi, uh, who I would call the original Wolf Warrior diplomat, who got the chance to lecture the Secretary of State and, and the National Security Advisor on camera live from Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, and that is that um, it combines kind of my three big points that uh, as China cares less about international criticism, as China is more capable and more willing to expand. And as China is less interested in diversity within its country, within its borders, uh, uh, less willing to brook any dissent um, and more interested in others becoming, frankly, more Han, more Chinese, as Beijing defines it, um, we will get more uh, obstinacy. We will get more lectures from diplomats in China. You know, Xi Jinping recently said that we have to do a better job at selling ourselves to the world. Um, make no mistake, uh, that is not about winning over hearts and minds by um, suddenly turning CGTN into, into something different. Uh, that is by 
embracing the idea of, of diplomatic confrontation, rhetorical confrontation. Uh, and they are using Xinjiang as the jumping off point uh, that Hong Kong, uh, to a certain extent, is kind of um, is, is won, you know, but Xinjiang will continue to be the human rights stain that the U.S. wants to bring up, and it will continue to be uh, the single thing um, that 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 the Chinese will push back on even more. Than, than anything else. Taiwan, of course, is its own category, which will always be uh, the biggest problem between the United States and, and, and Beijing. But, but Xinjiang is the example, in my opinion, of, of and, I, and I think this was happening pre-COVID, but a post-COVID Beijing uh, that is simply uh, much more aggressive rhetorically, much less willing to even entertain criticism, uh, and, and much more uh, willing to, to flex its muscles, both militarily, but diplomatically and economically. Uh, and so I think that that's going to be the legacy of, of COVID, uh, as certainly as it relates to human rights in, in Xinjiang. And um, Nick, I apologize uh, to interrupt you. We have a question from Ron Cox and asked for a little more background about the term wolf warrior. Oh, no. sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Ron. Uh, and and I'll, I think I'm, I'll, I'll wrap it up, right? It's about my time. Um, and I guess this is this is good. So uh, uh, when was the first one? About ten years ago, uh, maybe a little less, maybe eight years ago. Uh, Wolf Warrior was a film in in China, uh, and it was incredibly popular. It was about, and I'm going to try and do to, to introduce this narrative in a specific way. It was about a former soldier who had been separated from the military, slightly dubious circumstances, who is disgruntled, who's kind of a loner, who becomes a hero and in becoming, sorry, and becomes like kind of like an outlaw hero, right? And in becoming that hero, he kind of takes on the authorities or takes on what we've seen, what we think of as as, as the authorities, but it's really, it's really not. Um, and seen as a vigilante, a vigilante who could deliver justice for his people. So this is 2012 or 13, right? Maybe 14, I forget, Wolf Warrior 1, maybe it was after Xi Jinping. And I didn't do a very good job, um, but uh, the parallels to Rambo are purposeful, literal, and linear. I interviewed the director, writer, and star of, of Wolf Warrior. Um, and I said, what's your inspiration? And he said, you guys have heroes. We need heroes too. And they took the Cold War icon of American cinema right? The vigilante, the grump, the, the, you know, the guy who ends up in town and in the forest, right? I mean, those of you who haven't seen First Rambo, none of this will make any sense. But, you know, the guy who ends up as the vigilante, he's a hero because he's a vigilante. He's a hero because something's happened. In that case, with, with Rambo, um, uh, it, it's a little different in, in Wolf Warrior. But, you know, something's happened to separate him from the military, but he's still got that, those muscles. He's still got the power. Uh, he still got that independent streak, uh, and it was a sensation in, in China, um, and even more so than the first Rambo. You know, um, it's like like he combined it with Rocky IV, right? Like the one one I think it's four with the the Soviet. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, where where they're fighting, the patriotism and nationalism imbued in Wolf Warrior is uh, at its absolute core. That was one, sensation. Wolf Warrior 2 was the biggest movie in Chinese history. And so you take all of those, uh, that, that, that kind of, uh, uh, that frame. So you've got a vigilante, former special forces, uh, muscular, you know, gets removed from the military and then vigilante hero saves the day. Um, um, uh, you know, and defeats the Soviets uh, in, in Rambo's case. Um, Wolf Warrior II is a Chinese special forces officer 
who evacuates and saves the day in Africa, thousands of Africans, it's like a generic African country, and Chinese officials and soldiers deployed to this African country on like a medical humanitarian mission. And I kid you not, the enemy, the guy he kills with his bare hands is an American and like pure American imperialist. Like it is a caricature of an American imperialist. That is Wolf Warrior. And so Wolf Warrior means unabashedly patriotic nationalist claiming that what the Chinese do are, 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 is, is, is generous to the world and describing the Americans in this case, just like you know, we saw in our films in the Cold War, the Soviets, as the evil baddies who are capitalists and run amok and all that. Um, and so the phrase, I don't know who assigned Xiaoli Jian, Wolf Warrior, but it absolutely stuck. Um, and so now it's, it's commonplace to talk about wolf warrior diplomacy. It is uh, brook no dissent. Go on Twitter and just, you know, type anything you want against anybody who, who replies to you. Uh, and, it's, and it's spread. You know, there are ambassadors now who will go on the BBC and start yelling at journalists. You know, this is just a very different approach uh, than, than in the past. And, and that wolf warrior diplomacy, um, I would say, is symbolic of it. Well, thank you so much, Nick. That was fascinating comments. I really appreciate how you took the time to kind of break things down. I thought the, the it was perfect to have some of those visuals. Um, well, we're going to enter now the Q&A session and encourage people to please um, enter your questions in the chat box. And uh, there is, I'll start off, I can um, guide you. There's one comment that actually I thought was really interesting. Interesting, and I'm going to then co comment that notwithstanding COVID, Taiwan is increasingly a, a small player uh, uh, is in, in the world, my, is my opinion. I think that's really increasingly, it's becoming a bigger player. So um, I uh, wanted to just tie in a question because I'm curious as to if, if any of your uh, reporting or research, um, you know, people have looked to how Taiwan has handled and they've made uh, the COVID crisis, and some people have said, you know, they handle it very well. They, they and and I think the Taiwanese government has been pretty good about publicizing and and utilizing that to show. Have had there been, I'll say, kind of um, uh, interactions, you know, with. Uh, from the central CCP to their rogue, the rogue province that Taiwan is often referred to. Uh, from China's perspective, for those who don't know, Taiwan is is a part of China, um, and you know the U.S. has a lovely uh, a, a kind of uh, agreement that there's just a one one you know we will we will recognize China while other some other countries you know recognize Taiwan. So my question is. Um, uh, throughout the crisis and throughout, you know, as things evolved, um, what, if any, were um, kind of collaborations, cooperation, deals, um, communications with mainland China and Taiwan? That's my general mm -hmm. question. So I'm not sure about communications uh, that were between Taiwan, between Taipei and Beijing. I'm certainly aware of one-way communication from Beijing uh, to Taipei, and, and more to the point, from Beijing to the rest of the world about Taipei. Yes. Uh, and then we can get to Taiwan itself and, and COVID. Uh, so, you know, um, most obviously the World Health uh, uh, Organization has uh, like the equivalent of the General Assembly at the WHO is called the WHA, the World Health Assembly. And um, Taiwan has been or had been, uh, I forget up until what year, had been an observer to the WHA uh, and Beijing, uh, the US and, and some others tried to get it back to that status, Be Beijing blocked it. Uh, Beijing has blocked uh, some vaccines uh, that, that were supposed to be sold or, or exported to Taiwan or imported by Taiwan. Uh, they, they've done that. Uh, and the biggest part is, is kind of what we talked about a little bit before, which is, you know, in the mass diplomacy, in the vaccine diplomacy, those conversations that China's diplomats have in countries where there's either have has been uh, or, or still is some uh, Taiwan recognition 
or there are Taiwanese representatives in respected capitals. You really see this playing out a lot in Latin America, especially. Uh, as, as far as I know, I'm being told third hand, uh, obviously I'm not in the room, but there is you know, a bit of a quid pro quo discussion between Chinese diplomats saying, hey, aren't these masks great? Aren't these vaccines great? You know, you really should cut Taipei off. Um, and, and so, you know, Taiwan remains um, uh, certainly long term Beijing's number one priority. Uh, Taiwan itself is a fascinating story when it comes to COVID. Uh, I talked uh, for, for a little bit at the beginning about how Hong Kong was able to, to manage the original COVID outbreaks. Taiwan absolutely did the same thing. Uh, we, we, we did this fun video following a, a Taiwanese woman uh, flying back home from London. And the number of checks as she arrived in, in Taipei, the amount of government uh, control and government awareness of where everyone was uh, and, and exposure to COVID uh, was extraordinary. Um, handing out PPE and masks for free uh, across the island. Um, and, you know, again, that SARS, that SARS experience really got them to one, uh, have their own intelligence from Wuhan to be very skeptical about Chinese claims early on, um, and, and three, lift a lot of the red tape that has, that has harmed much of the rest of the world's response to COVID. So they did extremely well. I think up until a few months ago, I think like seven people had died in Taiwan or something, some ridiculous number. Uh, they've now had a, a, a relative spike, it's a small spike, but a relative spike, and there's, some, there's, there's a lot of domestic hand-wringing and politics going on. Um, and they still don't really have a lot of vaccines, and that's a real problem for them. Uh, their own vaccine is going to be coming online in late July, so they're hoping that that changes things. Um, but, but absolutely, uh, very much in the middle uh, of some of the international um, diplomatic moves, very much in the middle of uh, the tensions, frankly, uh, between Washington, Beijing, and, 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 and the rest of the world. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Roger. Yeah, let's I am Rajeshri Sen. I teach at Olive Harvey College, one of the city colleges of Chicago. Now, you mentioned China is trying to gain influence by various means, such as donation of vaccines or masks or whatever. Now, what's new about that? Every country, including the United States, wants to do that. I mean, trying to gain influence and power position in the world and dictate foreign policy or whatever, a lot of your fellow journalists have reported on US foreign policy doing the same. So now that China has come to power and, and Taiwan has always been a minor player over the years. I mean, look at what, what's the story in Olympics. I mean, they used to support a separate little contingency when they first got separated. If you go back to history, China, Taiwan is, is a nobody. I mean, you know, China is in the UN. The five permanent members of UN, whatever, include China. They have influence and they are trying to increase that influence by whatever means available to them. How is that different from American foreign policy? When Trump withdrew and started doing his, you know, America alone and America alone, there was a hue and cry. Not only that, Europe, I mean, is not agreeing to that. So can you throw you some light on what's so different about China? I'm not suggesting there is anything different. I, I, don't, I don't do, you know, uh, I'm, do, I'm doing, you know, foreign policy and, and, no, and I look at- fact, reporting facts, but I'm saying this has been age old, story <laughs> sure and 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 just just to give you a little bit of of uh of a point to back you up uh so so um when i was last in beijing we did this interview uh with uh the, the foreign ministry has think tanks um that it supports uh and so the head of the think tank which is a former ambassador um you know makes the same argument that that you know what what china is doing today 
is, is actually a little bit less of what the U.S. does today with with its kind of military presence exactly. and, and military sales around the world, as it, as the U.S. did post-war. Uh, the Marshall Plan um, exactly. was designed to ensure that like-minded allies emerged uh, as better countries and as allies of the U.S. And, and at the same time, you know, Bretton Woods, we created the United States created you know, with, with, with Western allies, but the United States created, you know, the system that, that we define now as the international system. Um, and, you know, look at Japan for what it was pre-war versus post-war. And absolutely the U.S. has I mean, used You seem it. to be complaining about China. Did I get that wrong? <laughs> I you, mean, you, can, you can take whatever uh, assumption you want. Uh, I, I'm, I'm only pointing out, um, that China's, you know, expanding its influence. I think um, if you want to put a value on it, which I haven't, uh, but if, if you are, are interested in, in evaluating uh, whether that influence is a good thing or not, um, you know, I, I do think the United States government, both Democratic and Republican for the last five years, uh, both believe that the spread of Chinese influence is negative, that, that they believe that the system that has created uh, the largest and longest um, uh, expansion of individual uh, wealth and lifted the most people out of poverty in the history of the world last 80 years should continue. I think the Chinese would say, okay, well, we're not trying to destroy the system. We're just trying to influence so that it's not only yours. Um, I think some Americans think that the Chinese want to destroy the system. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, evaluating that, but, but obviously there's other parts of the world. You know, I was having lunch with the Pakistani ambassador today and, you know, he was saying, look, you know, you guys lecture us and, and you know, China is <clears throat> an economic powerhouse and, and we're gonna be closer to China economically, uh, even if ironically in, in the subcontinent uh, culturally, you know, they're, they're post-British, they're British <clears throat> in terms of laws, um, as, as you know. So. You know, no, I'm I'm trying not to uh, to uh, put a value on it. Uh, if 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 you think I did, then um, you know I I, I get that. Um, uh, but I will say that that from the perspective of uh, the uh, DC, uh, there is a bipartisan fear that that this is not a good thing. I think in Berlin we you'd find a little bit less bipartisan agreement. I, I think you know uh, the Germans see less of this as a problem and see more of China as an economic uh, partner. Um, you know, China's BMW's largest market by leaps and bounds, for example, and, and the Germans are, are a little more reticent uh, of, of, of painting China in a negative light. Um, so yeah. Thank you. So we have the next question is coming from uh, Rhonda Martin, who I believe is gonna unmute herself mm -hmm. now and ask her question. <coughs> Okay. <laughs> um, yes. So um, over in the last, uh, I say few days, I guess five days. Um, what What do you know about um, the the new information coming out about um, the uh, NIH deleting um, early sequences of the uh, COVID uh, virus at the request of Chinese researchers? Um, do you know anything about that? Have any like other information that you can share? And uh, I suppose that would give them an early start to a vaccine would be a good explanation as to why they had a vaccine before everyone because they got an early start. So, so a couple of things there. One, um, uh, it, it's a good point. I, I do not, I've not called the NIH uh, about exactly why that was deleted, I, but I think they've acknowledged that, that it was, uh, or at least, you know, acknowledged some part of that story. Um, and, but, but I don't know uh, for sure why or whether it was nefarious or, or, or whatever. Uh, I will say that um, a lot of the U.S. government scientific community has uh, very extensive connections uh, with China's scientific community. Uh, and so whether it's, um, you know, people's names who, who, who we know, Fauci or, or, you know, his deputy, David Morenz, uh, or whether it's, it's uh, less famous people, um, 
uh, you know, the U.S. government for, I think, uh, God, since certainly since China got most favored nation status in 92, 93, has poured money uh, into into scientists who to collaborate with Chinese scientists. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think Peter Daszak, who, who's really at the center of a lot of controversy because he's worked with the Wuhan lab, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, he got uh, grants from Clinton, W, Obama, and Trump before being cut off. So that's an example of, of, of how much American scientists have, have, have worked with Chinese scientists. Um, so, so absolutely that's happened. I, I don't know if that translates to something nefarious uh, or not. I, I think people's, you know, P Peter Daszak's critics would, would say he's too soft on China, but, um, you know, but I, I don't know that, that particular case. As for whether um, these early days uh, delayed a vaccine, I, I would actually say delayed a vaccine elsewhere. I would actually say no. So what happened in, in, in the last days of December as scientists, let me rephrase, as doctors were discovering what they thought was a, a SARS uh, type virus. Uh, I think probably by late December, they knew it wasn't SARS. What they initially thought was SARS, uh, because, by the way, because of that collaboration for many years, Chinese scientists are, are as advanced uh, in terms of their ability to communicate with other scientists around the world as anyone else. And so Chinese scientists very quickly posted the genomes, posted examples of what we now know to be SARS-CoV-2, what we now call SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and then at a certain point, Beijing ended that. But that was about January 11th, January 10th, January 11th, January 12th, I forget. And, and there's, you know, there's been stories about the Shanghai lab who posted one of the genomes and, and was shut down for a little while. Um, but but those, those 14 days, 15, 20 days or so, many Chinese scientists went online and freely posted. Uh, and so today's vaccines, are actually based on a genome posted on January the 10th or 11th or 12th or something uh, onto um, the, the, the worldwide uh, genetic database, forgive me, I forget the name of it nor even how to describe it, but there's this database online that everybody can get to. So uh, in terms of the vaccine, who got there first? Um, I, I don't even remember anymore, um, but it, it was less, uh, about whether the Chinese had access to the genome or not, because everybody had access to the genome. Um, uh, and, and you don't need the live samples for the vaccine. That, that's been proven, obviously. Yes, the Chinese did not share the live samples. I will acknowledge that. But you don't need them for the vaccine. Um, the reason that we all got vaccines so quickly is that in the Chinese system, the government infused the money into, into the companies. And the Trump administration infused uh, I mean, an unprecedented amount. I mean, it was 20 billion, 15 billion uh, into Moderna. Pfizer got a little bit. Uh, J&J got some. Uh, and so what usually takes years took months. First, first phase, second phase, third phase trials. Uh, that was Operation Warp Speed. Uh, that was incredibly effective. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I, you know, I, I think the, the vaccine story is not just the Chinese had access and, and got there first. Uh, the oh, well, that, wasn't what, no, that, yeah. that, that wasn't the, that, that wasn't it. I was just wondering if about, you know, about the, you know, about the NIH deletion, about the request from researchers to delete earlier examples of the, the virus uh, as early and, and it, it's showing months back before even December um, you know, gen genome sequences of the virus and um, the Chinese researcher who posted them requested that they be deleted. Right. So in other words, the evidence that, that Wuhan had essentially COVID already there, um, you know, that evidence was removed. And, um, you know, and the, this, I'm, um, uh, it, it, I haven't said. I mean, I'm I'm from Texas, but I'm not asking because I'm on that the typical political side. <laughs> so um, that's not why I'm asking. I'm, I'm not on that side. Um, I'm actually on the other side. Um, so so you know um, the the sources that I'm looking at are like you know CNN, New York Times, um, uh, WebMD took an extra day to look at the data 
Um, so I'm looking at like very legitimate sources, at least as far as the genome sequencing. And it was a it was a doctor who discovered it on like a, a Google Drive where it was forgotten to be deleted, found these genome sequences, and he like wrote a paper. It's not been peer reviewed yet. You know what I mean? But but Oh yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not discounting the story and, and I've seen I just haven't had uh I, no, I no, haven't, and that, haven't that was what I was trying it. to find out is just is have you heard about it yet? And if you haven't, but given what you've just written about, I like I'm giving that little nugget to you then. So sure. please go and and then um since I know we all share like uh, exchange information, maybe that's uh, something you can find out more about because you definitely have more resources than we do. I would definitely like to know more <laughs> um, than Thank I you, think. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you so much, Rhonda. <laughs> well, well worth it. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nick, can action. we have time for maybe two more questions? I just want to. Sure. Why, why don't we? Why don't we combine a couple questions and then? Okay. Then we can take two. All right. So I have a question. <laughs> And there she is, Iwu, please ask your question. Yes, uh, thanks for a wonderful discussion uh, of uh, the impact of COVID-19 on China and Hong Kong. Uh, I, you just mentioned that uh, the vaccine the vaccination rates in Hong Kong has been very low. I was wondering if you could offer some insight on what caused the low rate in Hong Kong. You mentioned that people don't trust the government then are they worried about the quality of the vaccine or are they worried about other issues uh, so that cause them to not be willing to uh, take more, take the vaccines? Could you offer sure. your opinion yeah, absolutely. on this? Okay, great. And, and should we do the other question as well or? Sure, um, I don't know, Ron, Ron, would you like to ask uh, one of your questions? You can unmute yourself or I can read it for you. Is Ron still with us? Well, one of the one of the questions actually had to do with the map and about it, whether or not you could explain why Chile, for example, paid for the vaccine, but Bolivia received a donation. That was the kind of question that had. Hmm. I don't know, this is too specific. That's, that's, that's a good question. I, yeah. I, I don't actually know the answer to that. Okay, um, so, all right. That's interesting. Um, all right, well, let me let me look at that. Uh, well, it's okay, so back to Hong Kong. So this, this is a good, um, you know, it's it's a good question. Let me get get back to it. Um, so, the the numbers um, I just uh, printed something out from last week. It, it is about twenty five or or thirty percent, uh, and it's and it's twenty five or thirty percent, by the way, despite the fact that uh, at one point I think they gave away a free apartment for anyone who was getting a vaccine. Uh, you could um, get days off paid if at your employer. Uh, you, you'd, 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 you'd get your vaccine at your employer. Uh, the airport authority gave away 60,000 plane tickets if, if you got vaccinated. Um, so it, it's really amazing that like uh, people are, are having to be bribed uh, uh, to do this. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I just, just got this poll. Um, very so very few plan to get vaccinations they are not vaccine skeptics like like they are in america they believe in vaccines um uh, two-thirds of people agreed uh, vaccination was the most effective way uh to fight the virus uh, and so there's two main reasons uh that i and the first one i, I kind of did very quickly uh which was um that there have been reports of death uh, in Hong Kong. And there have been some stories that have linked those deaths uh, to the vaccines. Uh, apparently, it is not linked at all. Taiwan, you know, uh, Hong Kong authorities have, have said that. Um, and, uh, you know, there was like a case of, I think, Pfizer going off, or like a small dose of Pfizer going off. Anyway, they, they figured that out. Um, and, and so there, there have been these, uh, these stories. Uh, that um, uh, that have have spread. So I, I don't mean to say that it's all politics, uh, but the number two reason that people are not getting vaccine uh, is they don't trust the government. So so uh, in the poll, it's I don't trust government recommendations. That's that's the second reason. Uh, and so you know what does that mean? Well, you know we can't read uh, people's minds. Uh, but, uh, you know, I believe that the context is what's happened in Hong Kong over the last two, three years. 
you know, uh, um, you know, again, when you have 1.4 million people filling the streets of Hong Kong, an unpre- literally an unprecedented number uh, in China, certainly, but, but even in Hong Kong, um, uh, speaking peacefully, uh, and, um, uh, and then the product of all of those peaceful marches was the national security law, was the stifling uh, of dissent, was an unprecedented number of arrests was the closure of Apple Daily, um, you know, that is inevitably uh, going to create a rift for, with, between the people and the government uh, that didn't exist uh, before, I, I believe. Um, and, you know, again, I, I do, you know, I do try and, and point out, you know, the Hong Kong authorities perspective or Beijing's perspective when I can. Uh, and, and from their perspective, you know, I, I am being Western, right? I'm, I'm being focused on human rights. Uh, what Beijing and Hong Kong government would say is those protests were not peaceful, at least not after July the 1st, 2019, uh, and they were violent and they threatened stability. And so national security law creates stability. That word is so important. But but that seems to be why people are so vaccine hesitant. Uh, what has happened politically in the last few years is now translated into uh, opinions of health. So it's people's hesitancy to this vaccination. It, they use this rejection as a way to uh, kind of show their disagreement with the government. Can we say that? Uh, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if we know enough to say that it's a disagreement with the government, but they certainly disagree with the government's politics. Uh, mm-hmm. a, and so um, that is translating into a skepticism in the medicine that the government is offering. Um, but again, I acknowledge that it's it's hard it's it's hard to know for sure. But you know, according to this poll, that's 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 the number mm-hmm. two reason beyond these these uh, these news stories about deaths that again are, are probably are, are scientists say not true. I think that is a topic that's going to be studied for uh, quite some time. I think that yes, was I agree. That watched and studied. Thank you so much, you for your question, and thank you, Nick. I know you have to go. And we don't want you to go, but I know you do have to go. And we greatly appreciate your time today. I don't want everybody else to click goodbye because we have some other things that are going to, but I just want us all to clap hands and say, thank you. Thank you, Nick. And to take your leave now. It was wonderful having you. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nick. Take care. Okay.